tonight on CBC Vancouver News. A third shot for everyone over 12 in BC and why there's criticism of the plan. The reality is I'm gonna live a life. I gotta make the most out of it. Breaking the cycle of trauma and addiction. That there's this idea that I can do it on my own. I don't need help, I don't need anybody. A new program trying to save lives in the Fraser Valley and. I'm feeling very proud. I have a turban on it. Quick thinking, BC international students honored for saving lives. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. So well, all British Columbians 12 and up will soon be able to get a COVID booster shot. For weeks now, the province has been giving third doses of the vaccine to residents of long-term care homes and to people who are immunocompromised. Now it's expanding that extra protection. Val Puri has more on today's announcement and joins me live. Val, how uh, and when will the program roll out? Booster shots will be available for anyone over age 12 who wants one. You will be eligible six to eight months after a second dose. Now, these third doses will be Moderna or Pfizer, no matter what you got for dose one and dose two. The program will start with those who have waning protection from their first doses, so high-risk populations. Generally, people who got their initial shots the earliest, those who are more likely to end up in hospital if they get sick with COVID. For the groups of people that we're focusing on right now, so those are the people who are immunized first because of their risk and the biggest risk being age. And we know the older we are that uh, we don't mount a strong and immune response to vaccination. So I absolutely recommend it for people who are over age 70 in the community, for people in long-term care and assisted living, for Indigenous people who we know are differentially affected and, and for a variety of reasons uh, are being more exposed to the vaccine, to the virus right now. It's estimated half a million people will get a third shot by the end of December and they are optional, not mandatory. The broader population will be eligible starting early in the new year. For the most part, the majority of us have good, strong protection against the virus with two shots and we don't need a booster right now. But come next spring, health officials say it's something everyone should consider for longer term protection. It's expected everyone who wants a third dose will get it by May. Okay, and BC is the first province in Canada to actually announce a third dose to the broader public. Is everyone on board? It's certainly something people are debating. The World Health Organization recently asked developed countries not to offer third doses. Its position is people in less developed countries are still waiting to access first and second doses. Now, no one is denying something needs to be done to curb breakthrough infections, but there is a body of thought that priority should go to those folks who have not been vaccinated. And if we take care of that first, there will be less need for third doses. On a personal level, I think we have a moral responsibility to make sure other places in the world get vaccinated first if we don't see widespread um, breakthrough infections here locally. And, you know, every uh, viruses go global. With global travel, there's no stopping a virus at a border. And I think we owe it to those places where they have not had good access to vaccines to take care of them now and make sure that this virus doesn't come back later in a new, improved and maybe worse form. We put that to BC health officials and they say the situation of vaccine availability around the world was considered in making this decision to go ahead with a third dose. Now that said, the World Health Organization has also said that it's important to look after vulnerable people whose protection is waning and is leading to serious illness. As well, it says the general public but shouldn't be offered boosters until uh, next year. And that's what BC is doing, offering a third dose to those at high risk first and everyone else in the new year, for the most part, that'll be next spring. Al Perry, live for us tonight. Thank you, Bell. As BC moves forward with its vaccine program, the number of active cases in this province is at its lowest point since mid-August. There are more than 4,800 active cases right now, with 457 new cases today. Of the active cases, 390 people are in hospital. 155 of those are in intensive care. 
And as of today, health care workers in B.C. who are unvaccinated can no longer work. The vast majority of this workforce is fully vaccinated against COVID-19. But as the CBC's Michelle Gusub reports, there are still concerns about what losing more workers will do to an already strained system. Across B.C., unvaccinated health care workers are out of a job, including this pregnant health care assistant. I feel that there is, for me, uh, there is uh, more risks versus benefits of taking a new vaccine uh, while I'm being pregnant. Studies show the risks of getting COVID-19 while pregnant far exceed those of getting the vaccine. And those who are vaccine hesitant are in the minority. 95% of healthcare workers are fully vaccinated. The majority of those who remain unvaccinated are in interior health. 1,369 workers, 7% of their workforce. In Northern Health, 376 workers, 5% of their workforce. This is, uh, as noted, a necessary step at a solemn day because it has um, implications for those people and their families and for patients and their families. Premier John Horgan says the risk of losing those workers outweighed by the risk of spreading COVID to patients. If uh, unvaccinated workers uh, become ill, that has an impact on the system. If those uh, unvaccinated workers become ill and they're asymptomatic, they can bring COVID-19 into their workforce, which will further disrupt uh, services to uh, those citizens. The mandate also includes paramedics, a workforce already under strain. The union expects upwards of 150 paramedics to be out of a job today. Losing one paramedic for any reason is absolutely not, not something we would uh, look forward to. But we'd also, you know, our concern is also if, uh, if somebody is unvaccinated and they expose a patient or themselves or their family uh, and are off work for those reasons uh, or in, in an ICU and that, we would worry that that would uh, hurt our staffing issues even more. He says every day his members save lives with decisions based on science. We are an evidence-based profession. We rely on our protocols, our treatment guidelines. Everything we do is clinically based. Um, so we're not going to stray from that principles of evidence-based, relying on the experts to guide us. While they're currently on unpaid leave, the province has provided a grace period for the hesitant. They have until November 15th to get vaccinated if they want to keep their jobs. Michelle Gassoub, CBC News, Vancouver. The chiefs of the Carrier and Sikani First Nations are declaring a state of emergency. They say the opioid crisis is devastating their communities located near Prince George, and they're urging political leaders to take action. It hits home because it's personal to most people in our um, member bands. So because we're so closely uh, connected um, as First Nations people um, in our territory, um, we know everybody that you know, is affected by the crisis. She says three people have died in the past two weeks. Their goal is to build a healing center in the territory that is culturally appropriate. For that, they need more provincial and federal funding. On top of a toxic drug supply, the problem stems from high rates of mental health issues and addiction coming from intergenerational trauma of residential schools. And most of the victims from the opioid overdose epidemic are young men. It's a group that experts say tends to stay silent about their struggles, with some turning to drugs for escape. As the CBC's Chad Pawson reports, a new program is working to build up those men and help them find purpose. These men have come a long way to be in this classroom in Abbotsford. All are victims of violence and all had turned to drugs to cope with their trauma. I didn't have to confront any of my emotions or problems. I could just, you know, snort some molly and just float through the day and everything was just, nothing mattered. 20-year-old Josh Rain had overdosed but survived and now he wants to move on in his life beyond just being a survivor. The reality is I'm going to live a life. I got to make the most out of it. A new provincially funded program is helping people like Rain, young men most at risk of dying alone from drug use. This is the whole reason for this project is to bring this to the forefront and say it's okay for men to talk about abuse. It's okay. It's a safe place for them. Laura Elout designed this program in hopes of helping male victims of violence who often go without the right support such as a meaningful job. The goal is to integrate back into the labor force in some capacity where you're making a 
a, a meaningful wage, a living wage, where you can be a contributing factor to the labor force. The Purpose Project addresses trauma, but also trains participants to operate forklifts, deal with hazarded waste on job sites, and do first aid. The province provided $170,000 to support it, and employers are ready to take on participants like Rain. It's, it's an opportunity for me to really build the foundation and the roots for my life to be able to achieve the goals that I want to achieve and a lot of these skills are lifelong skills. People involved with the program have high hopes that it will be a model for supporting male victims of violence and provincial funding will be expanded. Chad Pawson, CBC News, Abbotsford. Two new cranes are being installed in Kelowna at the site of a fatal construction collapse this summer. Five people died and some say it's still too soon to start building again. Nearly 400 people have signed a petition criticizing the developer's decision to restart construction despite an ongoing WorkSafe investigation. The petition also asks the developer to convert the property into a park or at minimum delay construction until the WorkSafe investigation is finished. In a statement from Mission Group, the developer says it has comprehensive procedures in place to assemble the new cranes. Office and condo towers are planned for the downtown site. Well, five young men are being honored as heroes for helping to save two people trapped near some fast moving water in a BC park. They used the clothes on their backs and the turbans on their heads to reach the pair. Dan Burritt joins us with more on the rescue. And Dan, quite the tale. Oh, uh, no kidding, Anita. Earlier this month, international students Ajay Kumar, Arvindjit Singh, Gagandeep Singh, Kuljinder Singh, and Gurpreet Singh were out for a hike in Golden Ears Park. And that's when they spotted two men dangerously close to being swept away in the 10 meter high lower falls. They worked quickly, removing their turbans and jackets, tying them together to make a 30 foot makeshift rope and throwing it to them. And with that, they helped pull those two men to safety. So today, Ridge Meadows RCMP in the cities of Maple Ridge and Pitt Meadows presented each of the five with special commendations. The RCMP superintendent, herself a Punjabi Sikh, noted the cultural importance of the men using their turbans to perform this rescue. Turbans are considered central to the religious practice of Sikhism and are not usually taken out. So many people saying like, the good thing you guys stopped because uh, not every person stopped there and try to help. Uh, so we tried to help and uh, I'm feeling very happy. I can't really explain right now. So yeah, it's a very good impression for our community and uh, for us for, as well. Feeling very proud. I have a turban on it. Singh says they've received global media attention after the rescue and they plan to meet with the Premier tomorrow. Anita? Amazing stuff, and you can really sense uh, what he's feeling. Nice, Dan. Thank you. Christmas activities are back on NBC after the pandemic forced the cancellation of large holiday events last year. But as Philip O'Reira tells us, most of the popular events will have some restrictions. It's one of BC's most visited holiday attractions. And this year, preparations for bright lights in Stanley Park have started two weeks earlier than usual. For the next month, volunteer crews here will be putting up around two million lights. We've got a lot of new lights because we bought lights for last year and didn't get to use them. So uh, we got lots of brand new lights and uh, we got a few more displays to put out. But not everyone will be able to attend due to capacity limits only those who buy tickets online get to board the Christmas train. In the Fraser Valley, Glow Langley will once again hold a drive through festival featuring a 20-minute cruise into an illuminated wonderland. Proof of vaccination will not be required at both Glow and Stanley, but it will be needed to enter other popular attractions, including the Christmas market at Jackpool Plaza and Van Dusen's Festival of Lights. We will be limiting capacity each night and we have half hour entry times throughout the night to make sure that um, it doesn't get too busy or congested inside. We also are requiring online tickets only, so there's no in-person sales at the gate, so everybody has to purchase in advance. Elsewhere in the province, holiday preparations are underway for the Heritage Christmas at Burnaby Village and the Lice at Lafarge event in Coquitlam is back after a year in the dark. Philip Oera, CBC News, Vancouver. Excited to check out all of those attractions for sure. And also back since the starting of the pandemic, Canucks home games with fans in the stands. Rogers Arena finally opening tonight for the NHL regular season for the first time in nearly 600 days. That's where our Mira Baines is live tonight. 
Mira, lots of people behind you there. Uh, probably a pretty excited crowd about the, the game, waiting for the puck to drop. That's right. There's a party on the plaza. You know, this is the first time we've seen Rogers Arena this excited. A lot of people here. Now we have a lot of people wearing their Canucks jerseys. But we also are starting to get some rain right now. But the line behind me to get in is moving very briskly. People uh, are being told that they have to show their BC vaccine passport and have a mask with them, which they're to keep on throughout uh, the night if they're not eating or drinking. But people here are very excited. We've seen the bobbleheads out here tonight. We heard that Kirk McLean uh, was to be here in a tent signing autographs. A lot of excitement. We spoke to fans. One fan drove 13 hours just to be here tonight. And so this is because this is the first uh, home game at full capacity since March 10th, 2020. That's about 595 days. Take a listen to what people had to say. We traveled uh, 13 hours just to get here, like just for this game. So yeah, it's tremendous. Like it's an amazing feeling and it's uh, unexplainable. Like, I don't know, the magic, magic of just being in the Rogers arena and then, you know, the Canucks players, they feel it. Here I have a poster for Besser. He's my favorite player. And I'm super excited because I haven't been to a game in a year and a bit. He was a catalyst. He dragged me out. His wallet wasn't available, apparently, so I had to pay for the tickets, but, but we're just going to have fun tonight. Um, you know, I, I would have been concerned before, but uh, I think now it's like you have to be fully vaccinated to go in, so that's a good thing. They just uh, they just updated the mandate, so that's nice to hear. So uh, should be okay, I think, hopefully. I'm loving the energy, but, you know, he alluded to the fact that new COVID protocols are in place for games going forward. So what's different, Mira? Well, on Monday, Provincial Health Officer Dr. Bonnie Henry lifted uh, capacity limits for large gatherings like this one before some of the games were at 50% capacity, and that was for some of the preseason games. And now, as I mentioned, fans attending here are going to have to show their BC vaccine passport uh, just to get into Rogers Arena. They're supposed to be wearing a mask when they're not eating or drinking. And so those are some of the rules. I spoke to some fans. They say that they're feeling uh, relatively comfortable with that. And they were just really eager to be out tonight to watch this uh, Canucks home game. So, um, you know, let them enjoy. Absolutely. Mira Baines outside Rogers Arena for us tonight. Thanks, Mira. Well, yesterday's storm carried a sailboat from the U.S. to White Rock's shores. A 34-foot boat crashed near the White Rock Pier yesterday. And it's still there, beached high up on the rocks. Authorities say the boat sailed from Washington State and they're trying to work with the U.S. to find the owner. They don't believe anyone was on board. No one seems to know how the boat broke free from the dock in Washington. But storms can cause anchors to drag or lines to break when they're tied tightly to a dock. Okay, Joe, I know it was windy, but it was that windy that a boat actually came all the way to our shores. <laughs> That's impressive, Anita. Yeah, and I don't know if it was necessarily the wind gusts uh, around there, seeing gusts upwards of 100 kilometers per hour, but again, it was that duration, the relentlessness of the wind that has now eased. We are now standing in a good old rain band. Uh, Mira alluded to that in the plaza, and, uh, you know, for our all of those standing in the middle of the rain downtown waiting uh, for the Canucks game. This band should pass quickly. So we'll get back to some dry skies, but just smack dab over the plaza for now. And yes, North Vancouver, uh, solidarity with uh, Mira getting wet right now. But things are drying out for one day anyway. In fact, earlier this afternoon, we even saw a few sunny breaks. I think we'll see the sun again tomorrow. Have to keep the risk for some late morning early afternoon showers that'll be mixed in with some sunny breaks, Anita. It's sort of a, a breath behind the storm finally for tomorrow. Uh, I've got a big change in the forecast though coming Thursday and then another 180 coming for the end of the week. And uh, in case we've forgotten the terminology, atmospheric river and then gorgeous high pressure system, I've got the, both of those in the forecast coming up. <laughs> Hard to forget those, but excited to hear about <laughs> I know. it. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Well, across the country, millions of tons of food is thrown out each year. But it doesn't mean it's spoiled and it doesn't have to go to waste. 
A group of Vancouver volunteers is working to save that food so it can still be eaten. Our Jean Paul Mendoza rode along with the team to see what goes into rescuing groceries that would otherwise be thrown out. These groceries would normally end up in the trash, but they are now being salvaged at a market for people in need. Yeah, we just got some surplus produce from um, Stongs in North Van. This is kind of all the stuff that they don't sell or they weren't able to sell. Uh, but as you can see, a lot of the stuff is still really good in quality. So we'll take it um, either to some charities or if the charities don't want it, uh, we'll take it back to the warehouse at Food Stash. More than 35.5 million tons of food are thrown out each year in Canada. In Metro Vancouver alone, the Food Stash Foundation says it saves around 30,000 kilograms of food each month. Volunteers weigh every box to keep track of how much is being diverted from landfills. As you saw in those clips, there's quite a bit of food that we've rescued. I probably have a couple hundred in uh, the van right now. Um, and if it wasn't for organizations like Food Stash, um, all that food would go to waste, which is just so unfortunate because Vancouver has such a large um, poverty um, issue as well. And a lot of that food is going to go to people who uh, need it and who need to get groceries for a little bit cheaper or even for free. At the rescued food market, people can pay any amount they want for produce. John Paula Mendoza, CBC News, Vancouver. Thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. I'm Anita Bath, and I always like to remind you, if you're not already doing so, you can always find our program live on our free app. It's called CBC Gem. We're also on Facebook and YouTube. A political shakeup. Who's out and who's in? Justin Trudeau's new federal cabinet. Why the changes? That's next. You are watching our commercial free live stream tonight. Well, it's been called the world's largest treasure hunt. And during the pandemic, geocaching has been gaining in popularity. People hide capsules in all kinds of locations, each with a small token inside. Then seekers use GPS coordinates to try to find them. CBC Ottawa cameras caught up with a couple of ge geocachers as they headed out on an adventure. Oh, geez, you got it. <laughs> nice. Well played. I was looking the wrong way. Geocaching is almost, for lack of a better description, a treasure hunt. It's GPS driven, so you're, you're using specific GPS coordinates, but what you're looking for can be different at every location. It could be anything from a little thimble sized container to a 20 gallon pail, and they can be hidden anywhere from a lamppost to kilometers deep into the forest. It's really, really interesting in that it can take you so many different places. Hi, my name is Mark. I got into geocaching during the pandemic because I thought it was really interesting um, when my stepdaughter introduced me to it. I first learned about geocaching at school and I kept it up because it's something to do when you're bored too and my friend taught me about it and it was really, really fun because we went together and I liked it. So the bare bones geocaching equipment is this right here. After that, you can start getting into more interesting stuff. A ladder, get up trees or bicycle. You'll see a lot of the hardcore cachers will have stuff for getting further out. You can do everything off of a smartphone. Your phone acts as your GPS. You load up the app, all the information is there. You click on a, on a geocache, pull up the description, hints if you happen to need it anything that'll help you try to point you in the right direction to be able to find it. And it's just up here somewhere. I think it became popular because it's, it's fun and it's something to do while and you don't have to be stuck at home. It was a way to get out, get some fresh air and get some exercise. With a lot of the sporting fields and arenas and everything shut down, I wasn't able to play hockey. This is my way of getting out, get some exercise, go for a bike ride up a trail, for a hike. Let's check that out and see what we got. The best feeling is, especially if you didn't find a cache the first time, when you get to a really tricky one and you find it. Bazinga. I feel very happy and excited that I found one because sometimes they're hard to find. 
and you just sit there and you just want to give yourself a great big high five. Good day. Let's say so. Yep. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has kicked off his third mandate with a major cabinet shakeup. It affects BC parliamentarians, including Harjit Sajjan, who is out as defense minister. But as Rafi Bujikanian reports, the shuffle means gender parity is restored to cabinet. Good morning, Prime Minister. Once again, Prime Minister Trudeau prepares to turn over a new leaf with a fresh cabinet. Some are familiar faces back to take on a new role, like Stephen Gilbo, now the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, shuffled away from Heritage, bringing his experience and a long previous career as an environmental activist that even saw him arrested during a Kyoto Accord protest 20 years ago. Oh my God. <laughs> Melanie Jolie is vaulted over to Global Affairs, leaving the official languages file behind and Mark Garneau out of the cabinet. <laughs> While Anita Anand takes over defense from the embattled Harjit Sajjan. Recent and repeated sexual misconduct scandals involving top-ranking military officials have had opposition parties calling for his resignation. Here are women in the, in the military. They're serious... Uh, allegations of sexual misconduct that have been raised again and again. But women have raised concerns and nothing happens. We know there is a uh, crisis uh, within the culture in our Canadian Armed Forces and the women and men who serve in the Armed Forces deserve better support, deserve a shift in the kind of governance that they have. Lana Haab, Patricia Haidu. Patty Haidu has switched over from the health ministry to become the new minister of indigenous services and Mark Miller is now the minister of crown indigenous relations. <laughs> Carolyn Bennett has the newly created position of minister of mental health and addictions and associate minister of health. We have a solid team with experience, commitment, passion to serve this country. I can't wait to keep moving forward with them for everyone. Absent from Parliament Hill today, Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole. He attacked the new cabinet in a statement, calling them largely inexperienced and ideologically driven, but wouldn't name names. The Prime Minister's office says it intends to have mandate letters for the ministers in a few weeks. Rafi Bujikanian, CBC News, Ottawa. A father and son say they've been left high and dry by a cruise line because they're Canadian. They say they were turned away while trying to board the ship. This is after paying their way to travel from Toronto to Florida. As Chris Ensing reports, they say their efforts to get their money back has been sent adrift. Billed as a return to the golden age of cruise ships, the MSC Davina impressed the penners. They won tickets for a trip on this ship in 2020, but couldn't immediately travel because of COVID-19. Last month, Eli Penner and his dad packed their bags and flew to Florida. I didn't realize it was going to be that big. We saw it from a distance already. Everything was exciting, and then all of a sudden we get to the port and everything went south. Standing on the pier steps from the ship, the Penners presented their passports to the crew staff. Oh, you guys are from Canada? Yeah, you, this is our, these are our passports, these are everything. Oh, you guys can't board. We're not boarding Canadians. So, like, it's painful, you know? Like, we come all the way to the port, welcome to board, and get spat in our faces. Eli says the cruise line handed him this letter that says the penners were denied boarding because they're Canadian citizens before being escorted out of the terminal by a sheriff's deputy. It's like the what's happened to Moses. Moses want to come to the promised land and then God show him the promised land from far and he told him you know cannot come to the promised land. 
Eli says in the half a dozen calls he had with the cruise line in the weeks before his trip, he says he had to provide their passport numbers, home address, and the company never flagged that it was not accepting Canadians. Oh, because we're Canadian, we can't board the ship now? Oh yeah, they should have told you. So they should have, could have, would have, they didn't. MSC Cruises declined our interview request, but in a statement says the Petters, quote, did not have the mandatory trip cancellation and trip interruption insurance for cruising with us and as such were unable to board. The Petters say they were never told that. They want MSC to reimburse them for their expenses. They say the company's offered to book them on a later cruise. I don't even know if I want to go back to MSC Cruises or to go to the States or even on a cruise in the future because it was such a bad experience. The company says it will soon have a new policy for Canadians wanting to book its cruises, but Penner says what happened to him and his dad has shipwrecked his dreams. Chris Ensing, CBC News, Toronto. We're going to take you to Japan now, where Princess Mako has married a commoner and left the royal family. As Lindsay Duncombe tells us, it's a historic decision that comes after years of opposition and intense public scrutiny. <laughs> There was no pomp, little ceremony, just a news conference and a pledge of love. Kai means everything to me, Japan's now former Princess Mako told reporters. This marriage is needed for us to live and cherish our feelings. You only live once, her new husband said. I want to be with the person I love. Kai Kumura was a commoner. The couple met at school. And in order to be married, Mako had to leave the Japanese royal family because she's a woman, and that's the way it works in Japan. Princess Mako's marriage will reopen the conversation about this gender issues within the royal family. Women are not in the Japanese line of succession. By law, the emperor has to be a man. Like an aunt before her, Mako renounced her title and gave up a fortune turning down a traditional payment of more than a million dollars. It was a big deal. Uh, well, everybody says that, oh, this is uh, like Japanese version of Harry and Meghan's story. And just like that royal couple, this is a love story steeped in suffering. The princess was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder after intense media scrutiny focused on Kumaro and his family. For example, when he showed up at the airport with a ponytail, the media pounced. Uh, this was, it was unheard of. Um, and he was just, I mean, a long haired hippie, you know, I mean, sort of the, 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 the similar kind of commentary was floating around. He has since lost the ponytail. Some traditionalists protested the marriage. People fear the image of the royal family will be sullied. I have a hard time feeling genuinely happy for them. The couple will live in New York, where he practices law and where the spotlight won't be as intense. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. It's a plan to provide boosters for all BC residents 12 and up. Why one doctor says the decision misses the mark. That's next. In British Columbia politics, it's a whole new ball game: an NDP majority government and a new official opposition, the Liberals. Yesterday's election all but wiped out 16 years of social credit government. The SoCreds have been reduced to just seven seats in the 75-seat legislature. Premier-designate Mike Harcourt's New Democrats won 51 seats, and the Liberals won 17. The CBC's Ian Hannah Mansing has more on the BC election the day after. Yeah. So you got your haircut. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 9 o'clock this morning. It was hard to tell he had just endured a turbulent, caustic election campaign on the day after leading the NDP to a massive majority government. Our relaxed Mike Good Harcourt afternoon. described his goals as Premier. I'm hoping that we can end the, the polarization and the confrontation that has uh, been all too evident in our forests and our labor management relations and our education and our dealings with Aboriginal people and uh, to have a more civil British Columbia. We're summarizing the NDP agenda. 
During the campaign, the Sok Reds repeatedly said the NDP would damage BC's economy, creating huge deficits, raising taxes, and giving unions too much power. But today, Harcourt said he was committed to a balanced budget, and he had this message for the business community. You're welcome. We're open for business. The uh, ground rules are the same for everybody. Uh, which is uh, don't mess up the environment, pay your fair share of taxes, treat your employees fairly, and we'll get along just fine. Once we'll do when I get back. In a Vancouver suburb, there was another elated party leader this morning, Liberal Gordon Wilson. Just 10 days ago, his party had to protest to get included in a televised leaders' debate. Most analysts credit Wilson's performance with turning the Liberals around. Today, he and his colleagues were still contemplating their meteoric rise from having no seats to forming the opposition. There's some schooling I need to uh, to undertake, and uh, I have to I have to learn the ropes. Uh, and I have no illusions as to uh, to uh, any experience in this matter, uh, and I'm I'm consulting widely on it. It was the Social Credit Party that paid the price for the Liberal gains. Their political dynasty collapsed as former supporters turned to the Liberals. Today, Premier Rita Johnson, who lost her own seat last night was still trying to assess what happened. Uh, I'm really troubled at the way it turned out. It's very disappointing to me because I believe so strongly in what I have been saying and, and what we believe in as, as Socrates. A footnote to this election, despite their huge majority of seats, the NDP ended up with about the same level of popular vote, 41%, as it had back in 1986 when it lost the election. The difference this time around, the social credit and liberals split the rest. Ian Hanamansing, CBC News, Vancouver. Let's go back to our top story tonight. Everyone in this province will have access to a COVID-19 booster shot by next May. As Brady Strachan reports, BC becomes the first province to announce a third dose for the broad population. As British Columbians head into the winter months, public health officials here have got their eyes on the future. Most of us have good, strong protection, and we don't need a booster dose right now. Um, but come uh, next spring, uh, it is something that we should consider for longer term protection. BC is the first province in Canada to announce third dose vaccinations to the broader public. The province has already been giving them to people who are immunocompromised and residents in long term care homes. Between now and the end of the year, the province will offer them to people living in rural indigenous communities, people aged 70 and over and some health care workers. Then, starting in January, anyone can get a booster shot six to eight months after their second dose. I think it's forward-looking. It shows some element of leadership, and I suspect that other provinces will follow and announce a similar, uh, similar programs. Nearly 90% of eligible people in B.C. have received a first dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. 85% are fully vaccinated. Many British Columbians welcome the booster shot plan. Get your flu shot and uh, get your uh, third vaccine and we should be uh, good to go. I think you'll have a good group that will say, okay, yeah, I just want to get the third dose just so I'm, it, it would make me feel safer. I'm definitely all for it. You know, it's as long as, as soon as we can get all vaccinated even more, it's just keep us all healthy and safe. And that's the key thing, just to get back to normality. No matter which vaccines they got for their first two shots, British Columbians will receive an mRNA dose of Pfizer or Moderna as their booster. Brady Strachan, CBC News, Kelowna, British Columbia. Let's talk a little more about this third dose in British Columbia. I'm joined now by Dr. Kelly McNagney. He's a professor of medical genetics and biomedical engineering at the University of British Columbia. Thanks for being here tonight. Pleasure to be with you. You know, we were expecting talk of a third dose today, but I think quite surprising that the vaccine is for those 12 and up. What do you make of all of this? You know, I, I think it makes sense. Um, we're starting to see some breakthrough infections in, in folks who have been previously vaccinated. 
um, antibody titers tend to wane over time. And so I think it's good to have a third dose on hand for anybody should we start seeing major outbreaks and people have been vaccinated. Is it fair though to give a third shot to such a large group of people here when there are so many across the globe who haven't had access to two doses and in some cases, even the first dose? That's a great question. And, you know, for me, I would say that unless we see major breakthroughs locally, priority should go to those folks who have not been vaccinated. And, and if we actually make an effort at taking care of that first, there'll be less need for third doses. But there are places in the world, and, and I've got family members in places in the world where just getting a first dose has been hard, and they have been really hard hit by this virus. There's no um, anti-vax movement in those places. People are just queuing up whenever they can to get vaccinated. And so I think we owe it to them to provide them, especially if we're not seeing a widespread you know, infections here. So you think that perhaps the strategy should have been shifted to actually um, send doses to maybe other countries before we actually give ourselves a third shot? I would say yes, and that's a personal opinion because, you know, um, viruses tend to spread globally. We've got global travel now, and things that happen in, in other parts of the world are eventually going to come back here. So really, a priority should may, be made on making sure that everybody gets vaccinated. Um, those people who've already had two doses so far are pretty well protected, and I would liken it to saying, you know, um, antibody titers tend to go down a little bit. That, that means that the troops are kind of back in the barracks. It doesn't mean you've lost your troops. It means they've kind of taken a break. Um, boosts help bring those antibody titers back up again. The people who are really at risk are the people who have not been vaccinated at all because they don't even have the troops ready to go. Okay, then is this third shot that we're talking about a full dose, like what's been given to those who are vulnerable here in BC, or is it less than the initial two? As far as I know, it's going to be close to the, the initial boost that people got. Um, the evidence is that that tends to really bring up your, your antibody titers and they stay quite high and for longer after that third dose. So um, the, the, you've noticed that the priority is for older folks and people who are immunocompromised first. That makes perfect sense because those are the people that are really most at risk. Um, as you get older, you tend to have weaker immune responses. It takes longer to rally those troops that you have to fight off a viral infection. So those are the folks that are most vulnerable. But eventually, we probably are going to need the same for, for younger folks, too. And is this going to be like the flu shot? Are we going to need a dose every year? Jury's still out on that one. Um, I'm hoping it won't need to be every year, but it's a possibility. Flu, flu is one of those really variable viruses. It's a segmented virus that rearranges quite a bit, and that's why you see so many variants coming up quickly, and it's tough to make a good um, lasting immune response to flu. I think the jury is still a little bit out on the coronavirus. Dr. Kelly McNegney, thank you. My pleasure. It's the dirtiest of fuels, but efforts to stop its use in developing countries is an uphill battle. We take you to India next. At 641, you are looking at a live look of Revelstoke on this Tuesday evening. Wet, cold and rainy, but snow for the mountains and the highway passes. Jo has her full forecast coming up. costumes all based off of this makeup look right here so if you guys want to get some Halloween inspiration then please keep on watching so for this look I want to pale out my face so I'm going in with a lighter foundation and then of course I'm gonna be applying a little bit of concealer underneath my eyes and on the top of my forehead so for this look the contour is really really important and that is what's going to make this look really come to life so I'm mixing a cool tone contour shade with a little bit of a gray shade and when I'm hollowing out my cheeks I'm kind of bringing that downwards and then I'm just hollowing out all of my prominent features. I'm going back into that gray shade from my Pure Cosmetics palette and I'm using that to do my eyebrows so that everything is really cool toned. 
Moving on to the eyes in the same palette, I'm going to be picking up a light brown color and I'm just going to dust that right in my crease as a base. And then I'm going to go back into that gray shade with a little bit of Fix Plus and put that really pigmented on my eyelid. And then of course I'm going to smoke out my bottom lash line as well. I'm also going to bring this underneath my eyes to make them look super sunken in and hollowed out. To finish off my eyes, I'm going to be applying a little bit of black eyeliner and I just went ahead and popped on my lashes. Moving on to the lips, I want them to look super muted so I'm just applying a little bit of concealer on them and then at the very center of my lips, I'm applying a little bit of that grey eyeshadow to make them look super spooky. So my first look is, you guessed it, a mummy. So I have pre-soaked my cotton bandage in a little bit of tea overnight and this is going to give it that decaying, distressed look that I want. And I'm just wrapping it around my head and neck. Moving on to look number two, we are going to turn this mummy into a scary vampire. So I'm just swapping out my lipstick to really sell this vampire look. And I'm also going to shade in my lips with a little bit of black eyeliner to give it that really ombre effect. For my third and final look, we're going to be doing something a bit more on the spooky and grungy side. So I'm going to be turning myself now into a ghost. I have teased my hair up so it's super, super big, and I'm spraying some white hairspray into my hair to really sell this ghost look. This look is definitely a little bit more fun and theatrical, and last but not least, I'm applying some fake cobwebs to my shoulders and neck area. Three favorite last minute Halloween costumes based all off of this makeup right here, which was super easy to achieve. It's crazy how your hair and your costume can change the whole vibe of your makeup, right? And if you guys want to see more from me, check out my personal channel at Julia Dantis Beauty. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye! The Winter Olympics in Beijing are 100 days away, and we now know what Team Canada will be wearing. Lululemon will be dressing Olympians and Paralympians for the first time. Several athletes modeled the new gear at a launch today in Toronto. Much of the clothing is already available to buy, and Lululemon says 10% of the proceeds will go to fund and support athletes. The Vancouver-based company reached a deal last month to dress Canada's athletes through the 2028 Summer Games. And meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff joins us now. And Joe, I know there's a lot of uh, change, a lot of flip-flopping coming. You said it. A lot of flip-flopping, Anita, but no flip-flops in the <laughs> forecast. We are not flip-flopping that much. But I do have some good news for anyone who's... Uh, Still standing outside celebrating the Connects home opener. The rain has moved off. Let me start you off with the radar right now. That was a fast moving little cell and that's already tracking in through uh, Burnaby and the Tri-Cities weakening as it does so. So just a few spits and spots left behind tonight. Uh, thunderstorm possible across the island and the Sunshine Coast. That's all thanks to uh, a remnant low. This is a different one than our weakening uh, cyclone bomb that is all but dissipated in the past uh, 24 hours. But still looking at the risk for southwesterly showers through tomorrow. All right. Wanted to take you back to this atmospheric river who's knocking on our door. That is who's going to show up for Thursday. And that's why Environment Canada has preemptively issued special weather statements that will get upgraded to warnings likely tomorrow, but it's because this event doesn't start until, uh, you know what, that should say Wednesday night. Uh, so looking at a good 50 millimeters starting tomorrow evening for much of Metro Vancouver through Thursday. And look at that, the Coquihalla, the summit getting 10 to 20 centimeters. So this is a story really Wednesday night into Thursday as we get that atmospheric river moving in. Here's what it looks like through the model run. So tapering showers tomorrow, might even see some sunny breaks, and then bam, that atmospheric river moves in Wednesday, 11 p.m. Sticking around through Thursday, that's going to bring us a good amount of rain to Metro Vancouver. It's fast moving, though. It'll bring some showers to the interior, but look what builds in behind. High pressure, and that is going to mean another big change in the forecast for the end of the week. But 
the real rain again holding off until Thursday. It's just a one day washout. So breaking it down, few sunny breaks for tomorrow. Thursday, we get our atmospheric river. We'll probably see rainfall warnings for Metro Vancouver, cooler temperatures. And then behold the final flip flop of this week. Sunshine through Friday, Saturday, Sunday, some cool overnight lows. But Anita, I think it's about time that we had blue skies line up for the weekend. We're owed this one. Yeah, that is a good flip flop. Also, I bet you some people will be wearing flip flops. <laughs> I shouldn't have ruled that out. I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. The global impact of climate change remains dire. Greenhouse gas levels have hit a record high. One of the biggest culprits is coal. But as Salima Shivji tells us, in countries like India, shifting away from fossil fuels seems to be an impossible task. <laughs> The bustle of a city that lives and breathes in the shadow of black gold. Coal is king in Chandrapur, a constant, familiar presence. There's a mine literally in the backyard of this village, and the consequences seep into daily life. Wells have dried up. This one is dug ten times deeper than it should be to have any hope of striking water. The coal mines suck most of it up. And with the groundwater nearly depleted, villagers are resigned to collecting their drinking water from this treatment hut connected to a nearby river, paying a few rupees for every few liters. There's no water and it's getting worse, this local leader says. What can we do? Our farming suffers the most. As clean rain pours down at the base of the large open pit mine, Manoj Wagmer bemoans the loss of his land just across the road, spoiled, he says, by dirty water, contaminated. It's useless, barren, he says. No crops will grow here now. I can't make ends meet because of all the mining. But coal, the dirtiest of fuels, is also the backbone of India's energy production. More than 70% of the country's power comes from it. It means big money for many states reliant on the fossil fuel and jobs for some 4 million Indians, many of whom have no other options. Like in Chandrapur, where the morning traffic rush is hundreds of workers pouring into the coal-fired power plant. Mining for 2%. An economic and political reality this local elected official understands all too well. Mining we can't stop this. Stopping mining would be like abruptly halting India's prosperity. It's simply not feasible, he says. And the Indian economy's dependence on coal manifests in different ways. Take the country's railway. It gets half of its revenue from coal. It charges more to transport coal to power plants just so it can offer cheap fares to Indian passengers. An arrangement that's hard to break. Intricately entwined and so a tricky balance reigns. Demand is up as the pandemic eases, so much so that India is running out of coal. The country planning to build or expand dozens of mines and to keep importing the rest. A necessary evil, says this environmentalist. Yeah, definitely it will uh, take a time. Still, so we are expecting again 10 to 15 years because we have to uh, depend upon the coal. At least, India is investing heavily and ambitiously in clean energy like solar and wind power, but that will cover future demand, not current. And the international pressure is only deepening on India to reduce its emissions and leave coal behind. About 75-76% uh, of our uh, electricity comes from coal. So that's huge. I mean, but this climate and energy researcher says it's not really fair of industrialized nations who've spent years using cheap coal to demand more of an India struggling to develop. In developed countries we're talking about, they have something else alter as an alternative to coal, be it gas in some countries, be it nuclear in other countries. So India doesn't have anything as of right now. The shift away from the dirty fuel, not even an option for the tens of millions of Indians who still don't have access to power. India just not able to live without coal yet. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Chandrapur, India.
the long and winding road to a curbside repair. Why did it take 28 years to fix this Winnipeg hazard? That's next. In the year 2050, how will BC look? From agriculture to cities, how will climate change change life? Don't miss 2050 Degrees of Change, a CBC Vancouver original podcast, now available. If walls could talk, where would the voice come from? In the case of one Halifax home, from within. Renovations led to a fascinating discovery. Among the trove of aged, warped pages, a face of a woman unknown to them. In the photo, she wears a high collar, ruffled blouse, hair that's neatly quaffed. I think it's quite old. I think it's over 100 years old. I'm not a historian, really, and I'm not a fashion expert by any stretch. But when I look at the, the clothing that she's wearing, my guess is that she's, the photo was taken in the late 1800s or very early 1900s. A little sleuthing. Warford discovers the photo was taken in Halifax by one Harry J. Moss. She wants to find this woman's family. There's so much history packed into these homes. Um, and there's a lot of families like that grew in these houses that found, you know, that found their footing. Um, that kind of grew up together in these houses that we would just, you know, we would love to to kind of give back to the families that created a space that was available for us to move in at the right time for us. The house itself is a time capsule. It's one of the many built for families displaced by the Halifax explosion in 1917. Some items date their findings. A rent receipt from 1924 for $25 and a Christmas card that never made it to its destination. The Burns family was the second family to live here. And in, in 1923, they tried to send a card to Dorchester, Massachusetts, and it never, it never went. And it's just, you know, and that's just, it's such a relatable thing. The artifacts are a snapshot of life from that time. We've had a Simpsons catalog from 1930 to 31. Um, and they're advertising, it's, it's very pandemic-esque. They're advertising if you get your order in by 3.30, they will guarantee delivery the next day, which is sort of something that we've seen popping up again recently. One of my favorites is a coupon that says, this coupon and five cents entitles any school child to admission to the Halifax Poultry and Pet Show to be held at the Armories November 29, 30, and December 1st and 2nd. There's something about that that just... <laughs> I just think it's so cool. With the renovations complete, the house is up for sale. Warford has put a call out on social media to see if they can find the mystery woman's family. She says more mysteries may still await the next owners. We didn't open up any walls upstairs, so who's to say what's hiding on the next floor? Bob Murphy, CBC News, Halifax. Being 16 years ahead of schedule is usually worth celebrating, but in this case, perhaps not so much. A Winnipeg, in Winnipeg rather, a damaged curb first reported 28 years ago has finally been patched up. Sean Kavanagh has more on the long and winding road to repair. A little bit of curb appeal has finally returned to Calvin Holly Street. Holy, you know what, they're actually here. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it was a good day. Holly isn't exaggerating. The Tyrone Bay resident first reported the curb had been busted by a city snowplow in 1993. He remembers exactly because his son was born that day. And years of reminding the city to come and fix the curb was finally rewarded in 2017, sort of. A promise through the city's 311 line to do the work by a certain day. 2037. 
by June 26, 2037. So when crews appeared earlier this month to fix all the damaged curbs on Holly's Bay, it was a big deal. 16 years ahead of schedule. 16 years ahead of schedule. <laughs> but 25 oh years late getting it done from the first. In the last couple of years, Holly has gotten some help from the area councillor, Brian Mays, who pushed the city's public works department to speed up the process. Well, I should thank Mr. Holly, who's, who's been persistent, he and his wife, but it's always been polite, it's been professional, sort of a reminder, this is still a problem. May says the city has curbed the practice of sending notices to residents with timelines for work reaching out decades into the future. Holly is good-natured about what happened. As a recently retired provincial civil servant, he says he understands how things can go off the rails in bureaucracy. But in his curb case, he wished he could have talked directly to someone who knew what was going on. It's frustrating because you get a response like that and, and you don't know why. Um, and there's no recourse, no opportunity to inquire about it because you don't have an opportunity to talk to somebody in the department, directly in the department. Holly complimented the crews who did the work, saying they did a great job, and his counselor says he owes the resident something else. I think I promised Mr. Holly a drink as well at some point, so I'll have to deliver, <laughs> have to deliver on that as well. Sean Cavanaugh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Glad to see it's finally fixed. That's it for CBC Vancouver News tonight. We are back on tomorrow. Have a good evening.